and welcome to our author talk with Tom Poland, who is going to talk to us about his writing around the Carolina Bays. My name is Denise Spengler, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the Mary Frances Early College of Education at the <laughs> University of Georgia. And on behalf of my fellow Dean Charles Davis of the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication, I want to welcome you to this joint event between our two colleges and the Alumni Association featuring our shared alum, uh, Tom Poland. While there are many things to regret about the pandemic, one of the great things is that it has forced us to be a little more creative and it has allowed us to do things like this where we can bring people literally from all over the world together to hear a speaker that they would not have been able to hear had we been able to bring Mr. Poland to campus. So we are glad that you are all here. Um, I hope that if you're not already following us on social media or through your email, um, you will start doing that so that you get word about other events like this one. At this point, I am going to introduce Sophie Gratis, who is a recent graduate of the University of Georgia, an, an alum as of December. Um, she was a member of UGA's student-run newspaper, The Red and the Black, and has interned with some radio stations. She has a background in communications and a minor in ecology, which <laughs> makes her the perfect person to moderate our discussion today with Southern writer and environmentalist Tom Poland. Sophie? I don't know about perfect, but uh, thank you, Dean Spangler. <clears throat> So just before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to go over some of the rules for our virtual Q&A. Um, once our guest speaker finishes his presentation, we're going to allow some audience questions. Um, so if something piques your interest during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature to write in a question. You should see that at the bottom of your screens for everyone who's Zoom savvy. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on it during Tom Poland's presentation. And again, we'll get to those questions at the end of that. Um, of course, we're going to have limited time, so we might not get to everyone's questions, but I do really look forward to seeing what y'all have to say. Um, so let's get into it. Tom Poland is a self-identified Southern writer who's authored over a dozen books and thousands of features and short narratives in print. He's a UGA alumnus who fondly remembers Saturdays in Athens. Poland's most recent book, created in partnership with photographer Robert C. Clark, covers the ecological magnificence of coastal. <clears throat> and I'll let him explain more on that. Um, the book took seven years to complete, and it takes the reader through an up close and personal journey across Georgia and the Carolinas. Um, so without further ado, Tom Poland. <laughs> okay. All right. Where we go. Am I still here? Y'all lost me just like that. Oh. Looks good. Let's see. Okay, I'm screen sharing. Did you see me? We do. Put it into full screen for us. All right, great, great, great. Okay, here we go. Okay. I'm glad to be here and I want to thank the Mary Francis Early College of Education and the Grady School of Journalism and Mass Communications. Uh, it's kind of like going back home, <clears throat> although I will be in Georgia later today. Uh, it was a seven year project for me and six years for Robert. I spent a year extra uh, production work, proofing manuscript, indexing and all that kind of thing. And uh, we probably spent 30,000 miles in the cars in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. We went down to Valdosta, the Grand Bay Complex. It was the large, longest trip we made. We made a lot of trips up to uh, Bladen County, North Carolina, which is a Bay Ridge area. And we spent a lot of time at Savannah River site in Aiken and Barnwell counties where the University of Georgia has an ecology lab, not Clemson or South Carolina, but Georgia. And they were a great help to us. Um, we were always accompanied by two wetlands ecologists when we went there, Linda Lee, and the late Becky Sherritts, whom we dedicated the book to for her help. She had a misfortunate accident and took a year and she just, just couldn't make it. It was a great chance to go outdoors, a great chance to see things that most people never see. They say there are no adventures left, but there are. You just want to get out and do it. Here's the cover of the book. And what you see here is a place in South Georgia, Banks Lake, down near... Um, the Waycross Valdosta type regions, right close to Florida. And it's such a large, beautiful stretch of water with these magnificent cypress trees that a lot of people drive by it. There's a road nearby and they think, well, it's a swamp, but it's not. Because if you see a Carolina Bay from the air, it has a distinct shape, oval, 
elliptical and parallel to each other. You can see in this image that these are LIDAR images, light distance and ranging through laser light from an airplane that penetrates the canopies of the terrain with 16,000 pulses of light lasers a second, 16 pulses of light, 16,000 pulses of light that is. And it penetrates the canopy and it gives, um, renders a full detailed image of the contours and textures of what a Carolina Bay looks like from the air. And thanks to this technology, they discovered quite a few more bays exist. Could be as many as half a million. They stretch from New Jersey, down the Atlantic coastal plain, into South Georgia, and touch Florida briefly. What is a Carolina Bay? Uh, the name is somewhat unfortunate because it really doesn't tell anybody anything. It confuses them. The name is sort of mysterious itself. There's a lot of mysterious things attending the Carolina Bays. <clears throat> It's one of the landforms that few, if any, people come to any consensus on as to exactly what created them. Now, I'm going to go into that a little bit later. But uh, if you drive by them on, <clears throat> from the point of view of being in a highway on the road, you'll think it's a swamp. But if you could get above it, you'll see it's this beautiful oval-shaped landform that sits above the water table like a shallow bowl with rims, and they hold seasonal rains. <clears throat> right now, they should be very full. We've had a lot of rain, and that's good news for the amphibians and the reptiles that call these places home. Now, if you'll notice on this particular image, there's some smaller bays down in the left-hand corner, big bay in the middle, and several more to the right. Parallel, all the same shape, gave rise to the fact that people thought they were a meteorite bombardment. That, that was what created them, some sort of celestial event. <clears throat> you go onto the ground level and see them like this, you'll find that they have a grassy savanna in the middle, sages and grasses that change colors as the seasons come and go. And sometimes you get this beautiful zonation where you'll have colors and stripes. It's almost as if the rainbow fell to earth. Lush grasses and sedges and carnivorous plants. Right here in the foreground, those are pitcher plants. They're death traps to small insects and very tiny uh, animals because they have a beautiful fragrance that comes out of there and it lures the prey to it, thinking it's some sort of nectar. <clears throat> they will crawl into the tube. It's a modified leaf. It's one single leaf that's become a tube. And it's very convenient for the insects to get in there because the, the plant has these little hairs like steps that go down. And when the insect, like a wasp or a bee, gets close enough to the nectar, all of a sudden he realizes it's an acid, not very different from our stomach acid. And he tries to get out of there. <clears throat> and now the downward pointing steps, the hairs become like crossbars in a jail. The insect is trapped, it gets frantic. It tries and tries to fly up and get out, exhaust itself, falls into the nectar or the acid and becomes dissolved and adds to the plant's needs for nutrition because they grow an acidic body soil that doesn't offer a lot of nutrients. So nature's found an interesting way here to uh, supplement itself. I wanna go back to this. If you look at this big bay in the middle here, <clears throat> the upper area toward the left corner would be the cypress pond swamp. The middle area would be the grassy savanna. And on the right rim down here, you can see um, how it rises. That's actually sort of like a sand rim of white sand. It's beautiful snow white sand that looks almost like a dusting of snow. This is a photograph that sent these bays across the world and the country and made them phenomenon in the 1930s. <clears throat> this was taken in Ori County that are known for the place called Myrtle Beach. You can see how parallel they are, pointing in the same direction with a northwest to southeast axis. When this photograph made the news is that it was the advent of aerial photography in the early 1930s that discovered these bays. People said, well, it's just like the craters on the moon. Obviously it was a meteorite bombardment that created them. <clears throat> well, that was sort of a very popular sexy theory to think that meteorites had bombarded the land so close to us and gouged out these depressions. But the fact of the matter is there was no evidence of any meteorite impact, no shock quartz, no telltale signs such as um, ejecta, nickel and metallic ore and so forth. 
it was strictly created by some other process and um, that spawned a lot of theories, some of them are very absurd. Large beaver dams, giant nesting whales, dinosaur footprints. Now I'm, I'm here to tell you, some of these bays are 5,000 acres. I wouldn't wanna see a dinosaur who had a footprint 5,000 acres uh, in size. So what created them? Well, a lot of controversy has come and gone and a few theories sort of have weathered the storm, but they don't accept, they're not accepted in some consensus way. The most plausible theory that people uh, sort of accept is Kazarowski's oriented wind and wave action theory that holds that something like this happened. In the sandy coastal plain where the soils are loose, easily eroded, Prevailing winds over thousands of years set up wave action that scooped out the elliptical shape because the winds were from the same direction, you got this, this parallel structure and that created the bays. But what they can't solve is what formed the depression in the first place that that rain fell into. Now, most bays are not fed by streams or creeks. They're like bowls open to the sky that receive water. Now I've always told people, if you really want to get a good idea of what a Carolina Bay looks like, go to your kid's sandbox with a big tablespoon and press it into the sand, parallel, pointing in the same direction, and then fill it with water. There's your Carolina Bay. What created that depression in the first place remains a mystery. But here's one thing that's really good about these bays. They're homes to amphibians like this marble salamander all kinds of uh, reptiles, small animals. They're wonderful places that are rich with life. The word diversity comes to mind. You've got mammals, reptiles, all kinds of insects, orchids, carnivorous plants, salamanders. Uh, it's really quite an experience to stand in the middle of a bay and listen to the sounds of life around you. On a summer afternoon late when all the frogs start singing, the leopard frogs and other species, it's, it's quite a concert. And then you have the bird song that joins in. And um, one chapter in the book that I think is my favorite, chapter four, is called Dispatches from the Field. What I tried to do was to put you in the middle of a bay so that you see, hear, feel, and smell what I'm experiencing because they're really rich with life. and. Um, not all of them have Venus flytraps, just a few, but we're gonna to get to that in a minute because everybody thinks the Venus flytrap is really the thing they wanna hear about. It is a wondrous plant. Darwin said it's the most wondrous plant in the world. But these little fellows right here, these amphibians, they tell us what's going on in the environment. They're like the early distance, distant early warning line. If something's wrong in the environment, these fellows are the first ones to be affected by it. Eventually they'll make it way to us. This was photographed by Robert at Savannah River site. And, um, the Ecology Lab people escorted us around. They were wonderful to work with. And I gotta tell you, being a University of Georgia two-time graduate, it's great to be here in Gamecock country, Tiger country, with the Georgia outposts there at Savannah River site. Uh, these people are great. They uh, showed us around and they're very knowledgeable. Picture plants in autumn. They're not protected because they're not endangered. They're pretty common. You'll see picture plants in places other than the bays, but look how colorful they are. And let me tell you what they feel like. In the fall, when they're sort of drying out, if you touch them, they feel just like a styrofoam plate. They rattle like styrofoam, but they're not. One day I took my knife and cut one down at the base to see what was going on with the acid is. And what I found was about two inches of fine silt, looked like loam, fine earth for all those decaying insects that created their own soil, so to speak. It wasn't soil, but it looked like it. If you're curious, it had a smell so like cheese, okay? I watched a wasp one day go down in one of these um, pitcher plants. And I was kind of um, glad to see him do that because I'd gotten stung that day three times on the face by a wasp nest. And he crawled in there and realized he'd made a mistake and then the most furious fight you can imagine ensued. He tried for many minutes to get out and I thought, well, he must have succumbed to the ass. I looked and he was still in there. Then a few minutes later, he made a tremendous effort and out he shot, he got away. And I think the reason he got away was he was too big 
to go all the way down into the step like hairs and be trapped. <clears throat> so he, he was one of the lucky few that made it. If I ran a florist and I knew I could get some of these, I would put them in my arrangements. They're that beautiful. They stand about two or three feet high. Some have hoods over them, some don't. Um, I've been told the hoods help keep rainwater out so the acid doesn't get diluted. Now, right here, I need to point out something I do in all my talks about the Bay Book. Robert and I are not a scientist. We're not ecologists. We love the environment. We'd like to see it be healthy. We're not biologists or botanists. We're just a writer photographer team that had gone into about 40 of these bays starting in 1981 for me. In 81, there's a gentleman at USC Press here at Columbia that did a book called The Mysterious Carolina Bays. He was an attorney from Camden, South Carolina. His name was Henry Savage. And he was a great proponent of the meteorite theory, which was disproven. But to his credit, he has a bay named after him now over in Kershaw County, which is where Camden is, Savage Bay. Not only do the pitcher plants change color in the fall, but the cypress do, and the grasses have this beautiful zonation. So when you go in one of these places, it's just the most immense beauty you can imagine. It's not like a park where you have neat little walkways and uh, gravel areas here and there and flower beds and manicured lawn. This is the real deal. This is nature's garden. And they're very beautiful places. That particular trip, we spent the night, the night before in a tent and the dew was so heavy that uh, the tent was just soaked and almost collapsed on us. It was very cold the next morning and there was a lot of dew everywhere. And I was gonna, I'm gonna tell you about what that does to the bay when the dew is on the um, pitcher plants. This is Dry Bay at Savannah River site. It won't be dry long because the storm is coming in. I believe there are 55 species of amphibians and reptiles that live here. And there's a lot of ecological studies going on here from the lab at Savannah River site. The secretive pine wood snake has been collected here. And so this is a great place for studying the environment. And um, if you're kind of curious as to how the University of Georgia ended up in South Carolina doing this, in 1951, the Atomic Energy Commission reached out to Eugene Odom, who was a well-known and rather legendary biology professor, I believe, at Georgia. And they worked out the deal so that Georgia could come in here and establish this uh, ecology lab I think there might've been some money involved, of course, and both South Carolina and Clemson felt like it was a little bit too much. And Georgia says, we'll do it. So we did it. You can see again, how beautiful these grasses are. And you can see in the distance, the uh, tree line. I would go in the bays with a compass because I was always kind of curious. I want to line up myself with the bay and see if in fact that Northwest to Southeast axis went from the top end of the bay towards the sand rims and it always did. Amazing places to see and be. I believe this is a nursery spider, some species of nursery spider. And in the, in the mornings when you go into a Carolina Bay in the fall when it's real cool, you look across the savannah, the grassy savannah, the glittering spider webs look like strings of diamond no matter where you look. And on every mouth of every pitcher plant, there is a spider web laying across it. Because these little fellows have figured it out. Hey, we catch bugs for a living. This is where they want to go. We're going to hijack them. That created some debate among some of the um, experts. Was it good or bad for the pitcher plant? One school of thought said, well, they're taking their food away from them, so it's got to be bad. They're not getting the nutrition they're supposed to get. Another school of thought was, well, spiders are no different from cats, dogs, and humans. They have to use the bathroom. And their little droppings, which are rich in nitrogen, go right down into the plant. So I suppose one hand washes the other, and it's a win-win scenario. But uh, the multitude of insects that flock to these plants is just astounding. When I'm in the bays, it's been a while now, I would like to sit among the pitcher plants and just watch and listen to the struggles and the insects coming in there, crawling around the lip of the plant, going down in it. It's a virtual death trap, but they're so, they're so attracted to that nectar of fragrance, they can't help themselves. This is back at Banks Lake again. Now, <clears throat> the, the bays have really a lot of different kinds of names. Some are really beautiful, like Emerald Bay, Rainbow Bay. Rainbow Bay is at Savannah River site. And the University of Georgia Ecology Lab 
has put itself in the Guinness Book of World Records for doing the longest running uh, continuous study of amphibians in the world. They're taking censuses down there and te checking into the health and, uh, of the environment and everything. And uh, when we were down there one day at Rainbow Bay, we actually looked over there in the grass and there was a Guinness Book of World Record plaque that had fallen off a tree. It was yellowed and plastic and faded by the sun. We took a picture of it and I, th I think, I don't think it made it into the book, but we, we saw it and it was a beautiful place to, to study um, amphibians and small tr creatures with their drift fences and so forth. But most people see something like this and they think of it as a lake, but it's not, it's a bay with the water standing in. This particular day, this particular bay actually had a boat ramp built into it. A man's found all sorts of uses for the bays. Some are not very good as you're gonna soon see, but this fisherman went out at dawn with his feathery weight trailing him. And I wondered <clears throat> if he really understood where he was taking his boat. I have a daughter that works in Atlanta, Becky. I think she might be watching. And um, I sent her this photograph one day, it was in September, around a warm day. And I said, Becky, can you believe it snowed here in South Carolina? It's what my mother used to call a dusting. It looked just like a dusting of snow. And she was astounded by it. I said, well, it's not really snow. Of course, it's, it's uh, sand rim. And the farmer that took me to this particular bay referred to it as an old beach. He thinks it's where the ocean came up and receded. It was actually the rim of the Carolina Bay, very fine white sand. What you see growing here are turkey oaks. And the turkey oak gets its name from its leaf. The leaf is shaped like the footprint of a turkey, a wild turkey. These particular habitats right here were really sought after by the Native Americans. It made a great place to camp. It was clean and sandy. You had water and game and fish nearby. It was like uh, everything you need in one spot. And so some of the studies that are being doing today are some archeological surveys of the sand rims where they're finding various artifacts and all. But even the sand rim is a beautiful thing to see in the fall when the turkey oaks turn red and the sand is very white. They have been altered by man in some cases. People come in here and dig what we call borrow pits to get the sand. I don't know what they do with it, but you can see these every so often. So you've got sand rims, which is xeric habitat, as in Xerox, which means dry. Uh, these plants that grow here are very tolerant, desert-like conditions. Sand gets hot in the summer and dry. So the plants that have survived there are accustomed to such situations. This is Florida Bay in the Francis Marion Forest, which is also known as Wombaugh Bay. So for those of you who uh, make your way over to South Carolina to the coast here, if you go to Charleston, you take Highway 17 north towards Georgetown and Polly's Island, you'll pass McClellanville. You'll cross Highway 45. If you hang a left on Highway 45 and go about 30 miles up and then look for, I think it's called Half Something Creek. It's got chicken in it, so some strange name of a creek. You take a left and the instructions are real simple. Keep driving till you see the massive overhead power lines, park beneath them, then walk downhill and you'll be at Wombaugh Bay. This is where I got attacked by wasps. In all the years that we went to all these bays, we only ran across um, people twice. Once was a lady at Waccamaw uh, Bay, Waccamaw, Lake Waccamaw, who was looking for um, Venus flytraps. And she didn't find any, because I'm not sure they're there. And the other one was this bay right here where we saw seven foresters uh, coring these trees you look at. These Cypress trees don't look that big, but they're 400 years old. And they have a twisted canopy. <clears throat> Steve Bennett, who's also a University of Georgia graduate, wrote a wonderful um, foreword for us called Temporary Water. The beautiful thing about the bays is they fill up with water in the rainy season. And then when summer arrives and dries out, they're dry again. They get wet and then they dry out. The cycle keeps repeating. Sometimes they're wet for long times, periods, and sometimes not, not so long. But it's a beautiful thing if you're an amphibian. Because what this means is that predatory fish cannot get a toehold and establish a population there. So it's a great place if you're a salamander to lay your eggs. Or if you're a frog, it's a great place to lay your eggs because you don't have to worry about fish eating them or the prey when they hatch. 
So that's the beautiful thing about the temporary water, the hydrologic cycle. And um, as I said earlier, you don't have running water in most of these bays, but ironically, Lake Waccamaw, if you look at it on the map, you'll see that characteristic oval shape and that northwest to southeast orientation. It's huge, it's a big bay. Lake Waccamaw forms the headwaters of the Waccamaw River that runs down into South Carolina, very unusual. But these are beautiful places uh, in the spring and summer for wildflowers, meadow beauties, orchids and so forth. Um, the theme that I chose for my, for my writing in this book was it was sort of like one day you just snapped your fingers and trans, <clears throat> transposed yourself over to Florida. You just was there, I mean, excuse me, uh, Africa. You were just in Africa like that. Because you see sort of like, at least remind me a little bit of acacia trees. You see a lot of wildlife. You see grassy savannas. You see some exotic life forms. Um, you just don't see that in our world of highways, lawns that are mowed on a regular basis, farmlands and so forth. But when you get here, you're truly in a, in a wild place and a beautiful place. These lush grasses that grow in the bay um, sort of form a carpet around these buttress cypress trees. The lush green, the gorgeous wood makes for a wonderful, wonderful setting. And when Robert Clark first went to Dalzell Bay, which is over near Sumter, South Carolina, he was blown away by this. He said, he, called, he nicknamed it Dazzle Bay. It was so dazzling. And it is a beautiful place. It's Dazelle Bay is uh, within earshot of the Shaw Air Force Base over there. So when you're there, you can hear man's influence, but when you're inside this, this area of buttress cypress trees, it's really a beautiful place. And it's beautiful come fall and winter too. Dazelle Bay in the wintertime. You can see the waters there, the wet season's in. So it's really all about water. Um, Monday, I'll be speaking to a, a high school class who are studying marine biology. And my goal is to tell them about the water cycle in the bays because it's somewhat relevant to what they need to hear. And it's all about water. It's all about the water. People always ask if we see snakes and alligators and we do. This fellow was about six, maybe six and a half feet long. This is down in Valdosta, Georgia which was the longest trip I said we made about eight hour drive. And he was sunny. Now this is one of the bays you can go to, Grand Bay Complex. They got a long boardwalk that goes to an observation tower that's 64 feet high. We could stand on that observation tower and actually watch hawks flying beneath us. We could see all the, the herons, the, the great blue herons and all, waiting out there, you know, doing their fishing thing. This little fella, well, he wasn't that little, he stayed there the whole time and I watched from the observation deck as some young boys came up and it looked like they were gonna start messing with him and I thought, you don't want to do that. These things are very quick. But everything went well, and um, he was still there when we left in that same position. It's been called one of the more primitive animals we have in that it's changed very little since uh, primitive times. It's a throwback to the dinosaur era. And, uh, you know, they were hunted pretty much into a dwindling situation for their hides a while back, and then we opened, you know, closed the season on them, and now they're very abundant again. So American alligator in I think in their lifetime, they go through, through something like 3,000 teeth. This is back in Bladen County, Jones Lake, North Carolina. The night that we were up there was so cold. The dew was heavy. <clears throat> we got up that morning freezing and wet. And we went to this Jones Lake, which again is a, a bay. And this most immense, beautiful pink fog was, fog was coming in from both sides of the bay and sort of forming a plume up into the middle like steam. Robert was taking pictures of it and we could hear the Canada geese in it, but we couldn't see them. And then as it lifted, the Sanhinga uh, presented himself. Uh, the Indians, the Native Americans called it the water turkey or the snake bird. It has a very long neck, very sharp beak, looks a lot like a cormorant, but a cormorant has a hook beak. That's how you can tell them apart. <laughs> And it makes its living by swimming underwater, pray, uh, pursuing fish, you know, dart that neck with that sharp beak out and capture them, and then it'll swallow them. And after fishing for a good while, it, it gets soaked because its plumage does not have oil in it like a lot of um, waterfowl do. So it'll have to sit out on a tree with his arms extended 
for great lengths of time until it dries out again. You'll see them every now and then in a tree. They look really strange, all of their wings outstretched, but those are anhingers and possibly cormorants that you're seeing. So when you go to a bay, you're gonna see just this tremendous diversity of life and some it's really kind of unusual and scary to some, cane break rattler. Now I've got an interesting story about this fellow for you. I was to his left taking photographs and Robert was head on over him, like you see, taking photographs. And Robert kept inching in closer and closer and closer. And I could see the muscles in that snake start to tense up. I said, Robert, I think you've probably gone close enough, bud. He's, he's got your, he, you've got his attention. What a beautiful animal. And I try to tell people, <clears throat> snakes are more afraid of you than you are them. Don't kill every snake you see. They're very beneficial to the environment. They're beautiful creatures. They have a role to play in the bigger scheme of things. And, uh, you know, a snake doesn't stand much of a chance. The only good snake is a dead snake, as you've heard before. But they're really beautiful creatures. We ran into copperheads, cottonmouths, corn snake, this canebrake rattler. Um, really, really pretty creatures. And I always ask people this. How many people do you know have been bitten? Usually the answer is zero. It does happen, but uh, I always like to think of snakes as deserving a better chance than we give them. Beautiful, beautiful skin. One person at a book event I was talking about was a gentleman. He said it'd make a pretty belt. I guess it would if you like that kind of thing. Well, here's some bays that have been uh, ditched, drained, and timbered. One's got a road running through it and by it. Other one's got where the ditch has come into it. You can see where it's been drained. Then the, uh, they're farmed because the soil is somewhat fertile, not, not quite as fertile, I think, as people expect it to be. But they convert it to croplands, soybeans and what have you. And we've done this over and over and over to bays. We've drained them and uh, ditched them and drained them and turned them to our use, golf courses, parking lots, farm fields, uh, highway road beds. But there's an amazing thing that happens though. If you plug those ditches up and let those seasonal rains return and just leave it alone, guess what happens? It will restore itself in time. It takes a long time, but it will bring itself back. So in our book, we had two things. One was the preservation of bays that we judge to be pristine. That is, they haven't been disturbed by man or altered and the ability, if we'll do it, to bring back bays that had been disturbed. They're wonderful places. They're this beautiful habitat, dry sand, grassy savanna, pond cypress swamp. So many different animals can call that home. And the amphibians will actually migrate to them during breeding season because they know that's a good place to lay their eggs. No, no fish populations. I made the mistake of referring to them as oases and Linda Lee, one of the wetland ecologists at Georgia corrected me. She says, that's, that's really not true. She said, you don't wanna give people the idea they can timber right up to them and they'll be okay because a lot of animals need the cover of surrounding woodlands to get there safely. You know, we, we don't worry about stuff like that, but we should. I guess we know a little bit more about danger now from the virus, but destroyed base can make a comeback as I say here in my caption and uh, if you go to Woods Bay State Park, which is over near Olanta, South Carolina, it has a buddy bay right next door to it, the same size, Dials Bay. Dials Bay has been timbered, drained, converted to farmland. Woods Bay is a state park, I think Heritage Preserve, where you can go out on a boardwalk, you can walk into the thick undergrowth. Um, when these bays were first discovered, I, I don't think I really finished the name aspect for you. They were called Carolina Bays eventually. That's the term that won out. It's very unfortunate because Carolina seems to indicate they're only in the Carolinas. And Bay seems to indicate that they're um, something to do with water like along the coast. But actually the Carolina comes from the fact that the biggest and the best are in the Carolinas. And the Bay aspect refers to the Bay species trees that grow there, Red Bay, Laurel Bay, and so forth. So that's how they got their name. Leopard frogs, all kinds of frogs, amphibians love these places. And I, like I said, 
you can sit by your pond or, or at the edge of a creek or lake and listen to the frog music, but it's deafening in the bays. You'll have insects that come through there that depend on orchids and uh, part, in this case, milkweed. Uh, beautiful, beautiful places for them to get what they need in their little routes. And of course, the Venus flytrap, the star of the stars. Everybody loves the Venus flytrap. Some of you people out there watching may remember that Hollywood has done some movies based on uh, big Venus flytraps the size of cars that eat people. Well, that's Hollywood. These are about the size of your thumbnail. And they work like this. When a fly lands in there, he starts moving around. When he hits a trigger hair, nothing happens. There's six trigger hairs in there. If he hits the same trigger hair again, or a second one, a 20 second clock starts ticking down. And when it hits zero, it slaps shut. That's to keep it from slapping shut on things like a tiny piece of pine bark or a little piece of leaf litter falling in there. That's of no use to it. So they're really ingenious and they're stalked with the flower is really high so that it doesn't capture its pollinators. Pretty ingenious. This is in a place called uh, Lewis Ocean Bay, Horry County, not that far from Myrtle Beach. And poachers have learned how to find them. It took me 45 minutes to find my first one. But once you find a Venus flytrap, you know where to look. And so they know where to look. But North Carolina's done a very good thing. They've licensed commercial growers. So if you want to buy a flytrap, you can order it online. You don't have to get somebody to go dig them up. Or, or pay a poacher to do it for you. Orchids, yellow fringed orchid, gorgeous flowers. Um, snap your finger and go to Africa. And the anhinga, the anhinga, drying his wings. So that's a quick trip through a bay. Now, I would tell you that when you come through the coastal plain of Georgia and South Carolina, North Carolina, and you see a swamp, make a note of it. Go to Google Earth. Chances are pretty good you just drove by Carolina Bay. And if you fly over it, which I have, I've flown over them, I've walked through them, I've waded into them chest high. Uh, they're unique, really beautiful places. And they're still mysterious because we don't really know what formed them. I want to go back up to one more visual for you. One gentleman that helped us out a lot with this book, Michael Davios, who gave us permission to use these beautiful LIDAR images of his. He drove all the way from Connecticut to go into Dazelle Bay with us one day. And um, he had another reason for coming down this south this far. But we got in that bay and we hadn't been there 15 minutes. Robert stepped in a stump hole where a cypress had blown over years earlier and um, went eight feet under. Ruined his Canon camera iPhone, we had to abort the trip. I felt really bad about that because it's Michael Davies' first time being in a bay. He has an icy comet theory that uh, he thinks they came in, they were scattered across the Southeast Plain in, in the corners of Nebraska, like some giant snow plow went pushing through, throwing stuff out. He, he feels like an icy comet hit the Saginaw, Michigan area and threw all this ice and sand up into the air, eight miles high. And real quick, he did a, some study on it. He drew the axes and see where they would converge. When he ac accounted for the Coriolis effect, correct for it, they all converged in Saginaw, Michigan, which I found astounding. But the problem is the bays have differing ages. If it was a cataclysmic celestial bombardment, you would think they would have the same age. So the mystery goes on. But this is what I wanted to show you today. And um, we worked on the book really hard. It was a tough book. Three people died during it. Robert's wife had a heart attack. My mother died and one of our wetland ecologists died. Uh, it, was, it was a tough, tough book to get together. And about five weeks after it came out, COVID-19 hit. So that's my story. And that's my, that's my presentation for you. Thank you so much, Tom. That was great. Bet. Um, go ahead and stop sharing your screen and we can go into some questions. Okay. Okay, perfect. 
Um, and I do want to say, I mean, of course, I'm so sorry that you had to experience that loss. Um, you know, and especially this past year has, has been so hard for everyone. Um, I'm sure we can all relate a little bit to that. Um, okay, so I have some ecological questions. And I know that you said before, you know, you're not an ecologist, you're a writer, but let's see if you have some information for them. Um, okay. Hervey asked, how is fire a part of bay ecology, if it is? Very important part of the ecology in the bay because the uh, burns would keep, um, get rid of the invasive plants, keep it fresh for the native plants. And, you know, for a long time, we looked at fire as a bad thing. Any fire was bad. Well, that's not true. U.S. Forestry Service and the Sumter, I mean, excuse me, Mary, uh, Francis Mary National Forest, they go in and do control burns to replicate what lightning strikes would do. You know, lightning strikes would hit these bays and they would just burn naturally, which, which would help the soil and keep out the uh, unwanted plants. And one of the things that happened to me and Robert on the way to um, Wambaugh Bay one day, which we regret to this day, we were coming up Highway 45 and lightning had struck a pine tree in the forest and it was pouring down rain and a huge log truck was by us. We couldn't stop. We should have stopped and got a picture of that tree burning. It was biblical. It looked like the burning bush in the Bible. Lightning had struck this pine and exploded into flame about 18 feet up. So, you know, that's how it happened in the old days. You would have these fires from lightning strikes and it would be a good thing. It's, it's my understanding, I don't know for a fact, that one reason California has such problems, they won't do control burns. So all this leaf litter builds up and you have all this fuel on the ground. And when a fire does start, it's out of control. But fire is very beneficial. Another ecological question. Um, is there quicksand in the bays? No, not that I'm aware of. That's a, <laughs> you know, you used to watch those old cowboy movies and somebody getting quicksand, it'd be curtains for them. They'd get sucked under. We never saw any quicksand. They look a little dangerous. I can I can understand why someone would ask. They're very shallow for the most part. You can walk into most bays, you know. Yeah. I think Lake Waccamaw, you can almost walk across it. And that kind of goes into the next one. Um, Lauren asked, what bays are readily accessible to people? Well, it depends on where you are. Uh, in Georgia, down in the coastal plain, you've got um, Grand Bay Complex, 5,000 acre bay, smaller bays, observation towers, boardwalks that'll help you get get out into them. In South Carolina, you've got uh, Woods Bay State Park, which is uh, over near Atlanta. You've got some bays up in the North Carolina area in Bladen County that you can go to as a state park, like Jones Lake is a state park. Um, I wish I could tell people that you just need to get you some waders and go into a natural wild bay somewhere. But there's a chapter in the book in which we advise people, don't go to a bay alone and don't go to bay without letting somebody know where you're going. We heard a story we never could confirm that it was a photographer who went to bay by himself in wait, with waders on and his foot stepped between two sunken logs and they parted enough for his foot to slip through the slap shut on him and he was found dead there of exposure. I don't know if that's an urban tale or what we couldn't verify, but I used it in the book because, you know, they, they are dangerous places. You can, you can get yourself in trouble, but the bays are beautiful places to see. Um, Grand Bay, Woods Bay, Jones Lake, and then you've got some bays here and there that you can um, hike into. Steve Bennett has a bay named after him, Bennett's Bay, off of Highway 521 on the way to Georgetown. And uh, you can go, you can go see these places. Ditch Pond in Barnwell County is uh, another place you can go. And um, in Mineta, South Carolina, on Carolina Bay Road, is the Janet Harrison Heritage Preserve. You can park along the shoulder of the roads there and see this bay. It's a very interesting place and we put it in the book for, for a simple reason. It's what's called a high pond, which people believe it might be a Carolina Bay in the making, but nobody's sure because they don't know how they form. So you might be witnessing some history there. It's a beautiful place. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and I'm sure that um, people looking to, to access any of the coastal bays, um, is that information available on national park websites or federal websites? Oh, good. All you got to do is Google Carolina Bays and you'll see all the information you want to find. And I will, I will add this, it goes, it's sort of obvious. Uh, Carolina Bays are in the coastal plain. Mm -hmm. They don't form in other geographic regions like the Piedmont, of course. You know, it's just not um, suitable for that. And interestingly enough, in South Carolina, Buford County, down around Port Royal, has no Carolina Bays. Kind of a mysterious thing. No Carolina Bays in Beaufort County. 
I guess that goes back to their mysterious origins. We don't really know where they come yeah. from. Yeah, and plenty of farmers own some, you know, and, uh, you know, we, well, we trespass is what we do. And I still do it on my back road projects. If you don't trespass, you won't get anything. You know, everybody's got a, a gate up and everybody's got signs posted and fences these days. But most of the time, if people find you on their property and you tell them you're working on a book, they're okay with it. Most of the time. I ran some people the other week that were pretty rough on me. They didn't like me being on their property, but actually I was standing on the road right away. I wasn't on their property. Yeah, that's the asking guy. I, said, I started to say, oh, I didn't know you were on the road, sir. <clears throat> Yeah, property laws can get a little tricky. Um, Sharon said there's a small bay in Aiken, South Carolina. Do you know of that one? That's right. There's one in the city limits. I think they made a park out of it. As I understand it, it was in pretty bad shape for a while with pollution, trash, and litter. And I think there may have been some people that said, let's do something about this. And they started working on it to improve it. Good deal. Um, so I have a question. Uh, how did this project differ from others you pursued? You know, you spent a lot of time in the outdoors. Um, if you want to talk about any differences in dealing with nature versus people from a writer's perspective. Well, it was a tough project from the get go because <clears throat> a publisher asked me if I would do a book on the Carolina Bays. And I invited Robert to join me because we'd done all these other books in South Carolina, the Reflection series. And the first book we did was with James Dickey and Steve Bennett back in 1989. James Dickey, nobody thinks about him much anymore. He's a man that wrote Deliverance and was a tremendously great, wonderful, talented poet. Only genius I've ever met. And ironically, this last book was Robert, Steve and me and James Dickey again, even though he's been dead since 97. We had permission from his family to use his essay, East of Eden in the Carolina Bay book because it tells um, about the need to preserve the natural world and all its wonders. So, we started out doing the book and um, we got the feeling that it wasn't gonna be done in full color and hard cover format. And we had to break the contract. And we submitted USC Press and they took it, did a great job with it, but there was a shift in the leadership. The guy who signed us up left to take over the Pat Conroy Literary Foundation. And we were dealing with a new team who were wonderful to work with, let me add. So we went through some changes there and we had the deaths and all that. And, and it was very frustrating at the time because we had other things to do and to make a living, you know, as a writer photographer. And um, we don't get paid to do this work up front. We get a little bit of advance. So you know, it, come out of our, it came out of our own pocket, hotels, gas, traveling for six and seven years, 30,000 miles driving, you know. It was a difficult book to do, but really it was worth it because we saw so, so many wonderful, beautiful things. Yeah. Um... How do you describe your relationship with the South? Uh, like, why is it important to you that these spaces are preserved specifically in, in the work that you produce? Well, I think if we don't strike, if we don't dig in our heels and resist some of this stuff, the whole world's going to turn into a parking lot and a Walmart. You know, it's just the population keeps growing. They keep widening the roads. Interstates keep expanding. Um, you know, when I was at South Carolina Wildlife in the, in the 80s, when I was managing editor of the magazine, I first wrote a story about these Carolina Bays, excuse me, a film. I actually did a film with a 16 millimeter film back in those days, a long time ago. Uh, I wanted to do a story on Savannah River site. And I ran into some problems with, with my superiors because they didn't want to do anything that would make nuclear anything look good. And I know that that was a problem, but to me, you had 310 square miles cordoned off in Aiken and Barnwell County that are off limits to people. You don't have any golf courses. You don't have any Walmarts. You don't have any shopping centers. You've got bays, 300 bays on that property, over 300 bays. Wow. You've got all these natural places. Um, what a beautiful laboratory to study the world without man interfering. The interesting thing I'll tell you too, Rainbow Bay that's in the book of Guinness, uh, world, Guinness Book of World Records, it's about a mile from the P reactor, which they shut down well, actually, they had decommissioned it years early, but in 64, Johnson shut it down, and later they went in and filled it full of a certain kind of grade of cement that had some foam in it that's good at retarding, uh, retaining uh, radiation. They turned that reactor, which is seven-eighths of it's below the ground like an iceberg, into one giant block of stone. They welded the steel door shut and to stay that way for 1,400 years. So right there, a mile apart, you've got that radio uh, that reactor this solid rock and you've got 
Guinness Book of World Records study at Rainbow Bay. I wrote a story about that called My Atomic Paradise, Heaven and Hell. So I, I like the place and I'm glad it's there in a way. Uh, the world, the state record deer, state record alligator came out of there. I've been told, you know, and uh, Whit Gibbons, who was the director of the ecology lab at the University of Georgia for so long, he said, people like to joke and say it's because of radioactivity makes them grow so big. No, he says, the secret is no people. He says, no people are good for wildlife. And that's a fact. That is a fact. So it's one way to hold on to what we used to have in a yep. world that's so consumed with being like everybody else. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, we have a few more questions. So Ken said, did you notice any decline in the red bays and other similar species as a result of the disease that has been spreading across the South? And we didn't specify what, what disease that is, but if, if you know. No, the only thing I noticed was that in bays that had been dry for a long time, they had a lot of these plants that were coming in there and taking over. Uh, we noticed a lot of uh, maples coming in and all, but we, we didn't really, we really weren't tuned into that, to be honest with you. Okay, and then um, she said, is your 16 millimeter, ooh, sorry, 16 millimeter film on Carolina Bays available? Wow. 16 millimeters like some of us used to see in school, you know, back in the dark ages. Uh, I think probably they might have transferred it to tape at some point. Uh, I can find out. I can find out, but I don't think it is. Okay. Good to know. Um, she also mentioned Pettigrew State Park in North Carolina that has two overlapping Carolina Bay Lakes plus Somerset Place, if you... Not for me, but they do overlap. You'll have bays within bays and overlapping bays, kind of like links of a chain. Really fascinating places. Uh, go to Google Earth and, and, and search for Carolina Bays. You'll be astounded at what you see. Yeah, I think we can all become a little bit more familiar with them. Um, what's one tip you have for someone who wants to pursue a long-term project like this one, but who might be tentative or scared to do so? Well, it would help if you've got the credentials and the background to get yourself a book contract first so that you know all your work can be shared some way. Uh, the way the world is today though, with the Facebook and internet and everything, you can do something and make it available to everybody. I would say, if you wanna go out and do a project like this, be good with camera work, be articulate. Uh, don't mind spend a lot of time by yourself because it takes a lot of time to work this stuff up into a presentable form. Writing is one of the most time consuming things I know. People don't realize how much time it takes. And it kind of annoys me sometimes when I have to stop constantly what I'm doing and do something else. But those are some things I would say, uh, study up on it in advance, research, make contacts in the area. Uh, we dealt with the Nature Conservancy some in North Carolina and here in South Carolina, Robert and I had enough contacts from my years of work together that we, we knew who to call and who to go see. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Steven, another question. Graham Hancock and Randall Carson believe in the comet impact from 12,800 years ago in terms of the origin, I guess. Um, yeah. Do any of the bays date back to this era? I think some go back 30,000 years. You'll, you'll see a lot of uh, diversity on age ranges, you know, and um, I thought about that too because some of the soil conditions are different from one bay to another and that could have something to do with the age variance. But um, I've seen 30,000 years mentioned, 12 to 30,000 years mentioned by some. It's really all over the map. You have to sort of figure out what you want to kind of accept. You know, there's a lot of controversy around these bays. Yeah, I think that's part of what makes them so interesting. <laughs> um, last question. Will this presentation be available to view online? <laughs> yes, you can I believe that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it will. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how we're going to get it to y'all, but the uh, higher ups on this call will definitely have more information on that. Um, okay, I mean, that's it. I thank you all so much for joining us. And I hope that everyone at least learned something valuable from our speaker and the discussion that we had after. Um, stay safe. <laughs> okay, it. thank you all. And keep in mind, we're not scientists. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, yeah, but still giving us some valuable information. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me.